Welcome everybody to section three, exposure controls. In this section, we're gonna be looking at everything that controls the exposure that's important to know about on a regular basis. So got a lot to cover in here. Let's go ahead and get started. All right, first up, the mode dial on the top of the camera. This is our main way of controlling shutter speeds and apertures. There's a lot of very common options on here. We'll start with the most basic of them, that is the program mode. So P stands for program, which means that the camera is going to control shutter speeds, apertures, and nothing else. This camera, unlike a lot of other similar priced or lower level cameras, does not have a all auto mode, which the camera takes care of ISO and other things. It's just taking care of shutter speeds and apertures, uh, at least for the most part for right now. Uh, so in this case, shutter speeds, apertures, you need to decide ISO and everything else on the camera. Now, the nice thing about the program mode is something called program shift. By turning the back dial on the back of the camera, if you don't like the settings that the camera has given you, you can adjust them. Let's go ahead and take a look at how the camera is making these decisions and what you can do about them. So on the top of the camera, we have our cameras turned into the P mode there. And on the back of the camera, you will see our shutter speeds and apertures kind of down here on the bottom left. If you look through the viewfinder, it's gonna be in a similar position. Now the camera's program, the algorithm that it is trying to follow is trying to give you enough shutter speed that you can hand hold the camera. So that's its default thinking. If you're on a tripod, it doesn't know that it's on a tripod. It doesn't know what sort of shutter speeds or apertures you might want. So if you don't like what they've given you, you can turn the back dial and you can see it changes the shutter speeds and apertures in unison a small S pops up next to the P to let you know that you are shifting and that you are somewhere different than the prescribed setting. And feel free to adjust these according to your needs and photographs that you are currently taking. Next up is if you turn the front dial, that is gonna change your exposure compensation. So exposure compensation is basically the brightness of the image. So you're compensating with the exposure. So turning the front dial, and as you'll notice, there is also an exposure compensation button, and we'll talk more about that. You can use either system, the front dial or the button plus the rear dial to overexpose and underexpose your images. Remember, your camera is always trying to give you an even exposure, but sometimes subjects are lighter and sometimes they're darker than average. So if we take a look on the camera here, you'll see actually in green here, a zero zero with what looks like a front dial. So if you turn this, you can darken it up in third stops all the way to five stops and you can brighten it up as well. So in this particular scene right here, I have this white cabinet, which is brighter than average. And so if I was trying to get a correct exposure, this would probably not be right on the middle at 0.0. .0 it might be brighter by about a third or two thirds of a stop if I really want to mimic the brightness in the photograph as to the subject. And so this is where you can make adjustments according to how bright your particular subject is. So you got program shift as well as exposure compensation when you're in the program mode. Now you can use this in the aperture priority, shutter priority and program mode. They all work very similar in that regard. All right, we're gonna divert from our photography and go into our movie mode for just a brief moment. We do have the movie mode. And so if you do wanna shoot movies, you do wanna put this camera into the movie mode and then the record button will be your start and stop with a single press on it. We've got lots more to talk about in section nine on movies as well as in the menus. And so we're just gonna kind of cover this one real quickly because it is on the mode dial. And so look for section nine and section 15. Now in the movie menu, which we're gonna talk about in section 15, on that first tab is the image quality settings for, for the movie. And so if you are gonna be shooting movies, that's a really important thing to go get set up first. But we'll talk more about that throughout the remainder of this class. All right, getting back into the regular photo modes. Next up is aperture priority. This is one of my favorite modes for 
general photography, and this is where you get to set the aperture and the camera will figure out the shutter speed for you. So if you want lots of depth of field, you can dial it down to f11, 16, 22, 32. Depends a little bit on what lens options you have and what aperture it can go down to. If you want a really shallow depth of field, you can open it up. You'll need a fast aperture for this, like 1.4, f2, 2.8, a variety of options there with different lenses. And so on this one, one of the things you'll notice is that green manual setting. You saw this earlier with the exposure compensation. And so if we turn the top of the camera to aperture priority, you will see that the back dial now becomes green, which means when you change this, it'll change your aperture. And correspondingly, the camera is figuring out your shutter speeds, so you can adjust your aperture and keep an eye on your shutter speeds. And this is one of my favorite modes, because I often like to determine, you know, how much depth of field do I need for a particular shot, and does that give me the correct shutter speed that I am hoping for? If I need to make an exposure adjustment, I can do that with the front dial here. And so we'll talk more about ISOs in just a moment, as that's another important factor into this setting. But right now we're just covering the mode dial. Next up is shutter priority. This is kind of the opposite of aperture priority. You get to choose the shutter. If you want a really fast shutter speed to stop the motion of something that's moving very quickly, you might need 500 thousandth or something even faster to stop fast motion. If you want to slow time down and you want to show the movement of something that's moving, then you might want to go down to a one second shutter speed for showing a river in motion, for instance. And so one of the things you need to be aware of when you are in the shutter priority mode is it's somewhat easy to select a shutter speed that you want to use, but that your camera does not have an acceptable aperture. And in that case, the camera will blink at you. Anything blinking is kind of a warning that something is going wrong. And so be aware of anything that is blinking. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. We're going to take our cameras and we're going to move it into the shutter priority mode. You can see on the back of the camera that the back dial is now controlling shutter speeds. The front dial continues to control the exposure compensation. And right now at 2 50th of a second, the camera is selecting f4.5. If I was to go to a thousandth of a second, you'd see that my aperture of 2.8 is blinking. This lens's maximum aperture is 2.8, and it's not wide enough in order to get a proper shot. If I was to go up to 2 thousandth of a second and actually take the shot, the camera will allow me to take the shot, but if we play this image back, you can see it is very dark. I didn't have the proper aperture. So the solutions to this problem is to dial back the aperture until the, or dial back the shutter speed, excuse me, until the aperture stops blinking. So this is the fastest shutter speed I can get under the current lighting conditions and my current ISO setting. The other option would be to bump up the ISO. Uh, so you have a number of options there for fixing the exposure. All right, next up is full manual. This is one of my favorite modes because it gives you consistent results. And so if you are setting up a shot and you're gonna shoot a lot of pictures over a short period of time under the same lighting conditions, well, then you're gonna get consistent results because your shutter speed and your aperture are exactly the same. It doesn't matter the content of your photograph. Uh, as long as it's under even lighting, you're gonna get even results. This is also good under tricky lighting conditions. Maybe there's a lot of uh, dark areas, bright lights, very light toned subjective material in there that might throw off your meter. And in that case, you might wanna do a few test exposures, set your camera up manually so that you know everything's gonna be consistent under that tricky lighting. Now, when you are working with manual exposure, you're gonna be working with the exposure indicator, which is gonna show you a scale of over and under exposure, and this is broken down into third stops and one stop increments. Now, an even exposure is a great place to start with your first exposure to see how it matches up with what your subject actually looks like. As I say, we have third stops, we have full stops, so you can know exactly how far off the scale you are. And if you go too far off the scale, well, then it's gonna start blinking at you to let you know that you are more than three stops under or three stops over exposure. And as I say, 
starting with an even exposure in the middle is a great place to start with your first picture. Take a look at it in playback, maybe look at the histogram, see how that compares with your actual subject, and then maybe you want to overexpose or underexpose your subject a little bit to make it look a little bit more like it does in the real world. So let's go ahead and take a look at the uh, manual exposure. So let's go ahead and change our mode dial into M for manual exposure. If we just look at the back of our camera, we can see that the image is pretty dark, and so we're probably not letting in a lot of light. Now our front dial is controlling our aperture. Let's uh, open it up to say 5.6. Now we're starting to see an image and we can see our exposure indicator down here at the bottom. So we're gonna adjust our shutter speeds. And so at this particular case, one over 160, F5.6 is our correct exposure in here. As I said before, this cabinet is white and we might wanna have it a little bit brighter, maybe here at 125th over 5.6. And so that's how we would set up our manual exposure. Now, there's a couple things that bother me and I wanna show them to you because we're gonna fix them later in the class. Notice the exposure indicator and notice my thumb in which direction I'm turning the dial. You'll notice that it goes exactly in the opposite direction that my finger does when I'm turning the dial. And this has always bothered me. I don't know why a lot of cameras do it. Not all cameras do it. And the problem is, is that this dial is turning the wrong direction. At least in my opinion, the way I see things and feel things, they're just moving in the opposite direction. And this is something that you can customize later on. And so that is something that I'm gonna show you how to do later on when we get to the customizations of the buttons and dials of the camera. Now, if we look at the front of the camera, or at least the dial from the front, you'll see that it works in a reverse motion as well. Uh, so it's another one of these dials that I'm gonna want to reverse, and that's something that I personally reverse on this camera because I want things to be intuitive. If something goes to the left, I wanna just move the dial to the left, and it just feels a little bit more natural, and I do it correctly the first time around rather than realizing my stake and then having to reverse it. So. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. Now, a little note here on manual. There are shutter speeds available from 1 8,000th of a second down to 60 seconds. And so that's a pretty good range. But there are some extra high shutter speeds, 1 16 and 1 32,000th of a second, that are considered electronic shutter speeds. They're only available when you have the silent shutter turned on. Now, this is something we're gonna talk a lot more about in an upcoming section. This is something you have to go into the menu, go into the drive mode, and change the options for how your camera's shutter is firing to enable these faster shutter speeds. And there's lots more to talk about those, but those are available when you are in that heart-shaped silent shutter, as I say. We'll talk lots more about that in an upcoming section. Next up is the bulb mode. This is a long time exposure mode. And it's actually three modes in one, or at least there's three different versions of this particular mode in here. And so this is when you generally want a shutter speed longer than the longest shutter speed in the camera, which is currently 60 seconds, but there are some variations on this. So bulb. Bulb is a long time exposure where when you press down on the shutter release, the shutter opens up and it stays open as long as your finger is on that shutter release. And then when you take your finger off, it turns off the shutter. So you can have any length of shutter speed you want. You can do a second, one minute, 10 minutes, as long as you want. Now, live time is a similar version of this, and it's a little bit easier on the finger because you simply press it once to open it, leave it open as long as you want, and that way your finger's not resting on the camera, vibrating the camera possibly. And then when you're done, you can press it again. And so bulb and time are kind of the same thing. It's just the way that you start and finish the exposure with your button pressing is a little different between the two. Now this is good when you have a fairly dark situation. You want a long shutter speed. In this case, I wanted to do something around two minutes, I believe, so that I could get a light painting of the car headlights. And so it's a great option and it works a lot of times in cityscape type photography right at the margins of the day like this really well. Now, there is a unique mode called the live composite timer. 
And this is kind of combining multiple exposures and time lapse and compressing them all into a single image. So I was out shooting the city actually with this camera not too long ago, and I was doing bulb exposures, but because of the light levels, I was only able to do about a one second exposure. And it did not give me the streaks of headlights and taillights from the cars that I wanted. By using the live composite timer, the camera was shooting a half second exposure and then another half second exposure and looking at the bright areas and the dark areas and not trying to overexpose anything would record the light of the lighter areas onto that kind of multiple exposure, time exposure, and then it would do another half sec second exposure. And it did it a total of 122 times, not because I counted because the camera told me exactly how many times it was. And I was able to do a bulb style shot during a time of day that I would not normally be able to do a bulb timer shot. And so if you enjoy nighttime exposure, this unique feature on this camera, there is no other camera, uh, no other brands of cameras, I should say, on the market that can do this right now. It really opens up the doors to a lot more nighttime bulb style photography on there. So this is a really fun exposure and this is something that you can adjust when you are in the bulb mode. Now, when you are in the bulb mode, you can hit the menu button for additional information. It dives you into the bulb menu. So let's go ahead and take a look at a few options in here. So we're gonna turn the camera to the bulb mode up here on the top of the camera. And it's gonna be very hard to see because of the lights in the studio, everything on the camera dims down knowing that you're working in a very, very dark environment. But on the back of the camera, it says bulb, and you can change this setting to live time and live composite. Now, we're not really set up for me showing you uh, real time how all these modes work, so this is gonna be something you're gonna need to experiment a little bit with on your own. But you can adjust the different modes by turning the back dial on the camera. Now, one of the things that happens, as I say, is this whole screen goes very, very dark because you are working in a dark environment and this will help you not lose your night vision and it's just more appropriate for the light levels. When you hit the menu switch, the camera will automatically jump to the bulb menu so that you can immediately change the bulb settings because bulb is not a mode that you would normally use under bright light conditions. And so normally, if we uh, move this back to the in position, you'll see that the brightness of the screen brightens up when we press menu, it's of a normal brightness. When we turn it to the bulb mode, it goes very, very dim and very, very dark. And this is natural. It's the normal way that the camera works. And it's actually a nice feature because when it's dark out and you're doing bulb exposure, you don't want a really bright screen kind of ruining your night vision. Now, if you are gonna be doing these sorts of types of photography, one of the things I can recommend is one of the different cable releases or wireless releases available for the camera. We'll talk a little bit more about these in the camera connection section, but this way you can have the camera on a tripod and not be touching the camera when you want to start and end the exposure. All right, the final settings on the mode dial are the custom settings. We have four different custom settings that are available, and this is where you get to program the camera with your own setup. Now, earlier I said that the mode dial is in charge of shutter speeds, apertures, and nothing else. There was a small exception, and this is the small exception. This is where you can have the camera set up with any particular ISO you want, or drive mode, or focusing mode, or, well, there's a whole list of things in there. Now, the idea on this is that you would set the camera up the way that you would like it to work, and then you're gonna dive into the menu, and you're going to program it to one of these different modes. So let's go ahead and give that a try here. All right, so for my program mode, I'm gonna put the camera into aperture priority. I wanna put the camera into just kind of a very general mode. Now our ISO is over here and I'm gonna set this at 400. We'll talk more about ISO in a moment, but I just want an ISO of 400. And for my aperture, I wanna be at four as well. I'm gonna dive into the super control panel and I'm gonna change a few other things here. I'm gonna change uh, focusing into a middle-sized area. I am gonna 
Let's see if I want to leave this. So I'm going to, I'm just, just for fun, I'm going to move this over to continuous autofocus. I'm just trying to make a bunch of specific changes. Uh, let's see what else do we want to do. Let's, let's call it good right there. So we have a very particular setup. Now I'm going to press the menu button and I'm going to go over to our first tab, camera number one. And the first item on the first page is custom mode. I'm going to press OK. Now I can program this to any one of these different settings. We'll just go to C1. I'll press OK. And we're not programming it quite yet. We have three different options in here. Recall is where it would look into whatever is currently programmed into C1. And it would bring all those settings uh, live onto the camera without actually having in, to go into C1 if you just wanted to bring those up as a base set of settings to start your, uh, your next setup. But what we want to do is we want to assign this. And so we are going to assign this and we are going to set it. So all of those settings that I just set are now programmed into C1. Now an additional option is save settings. So one of the difficult things about being in a custom mode is let's say you set up a custom mode and you suddenly realize, well, this isn't exactly what I wanted. I want an ISO a little bit higher, one stop higher. Well, when you put that one stop higher ISO in for that custom setting, do you want that to be the new standard for that custom setting? Or is this just a one-time aberration that you needed to make a change on it? And I can think both ways. I think there's good reasons for that. How you decide, well, that's up to you. And this is where you get to make that choice. So if you want that setting to be reset every time you go into it, you really want those particular settings all the time, you would hit reset. If you want to accept that modification that you put in there, um, you would put hold. Now I'm going to put hold for right now. So I'm going to highlight it and press the OK. So it's set on hold. All right, so let's change some of these things back. I'm just going to put it into shutter priority, go into my super control panel. I'm going to change this down to small and I will just change my aperture. Shutter speeds a little bit. Let's change our ISO just to get it something different. All right, so now when we want to go to our custom mode, we turn the dial on the top of the camera. As you can see, we're in manual and bulb and we go to custom mode. You can see that we are in aperture priority, custom one. We've chosen F 4.0 at an ISO of 400. If we dive into the super control panel, we have the middle focusing area and we're in continuous autofocus. So it's exactly as we wanted to have it. Now let's say we go into the super control panel and we change this to single autofocus and we decide that that's our new favorite option. So when we come back out of the custom mode and we go back into the custom mode, you can see that it's now locked in on single autofocus as our new favorite. So as we make changes in the custom mode, it holds those changes in there. Now, which one of those two modes, the reset or the hold? Well, that depends on how you work and what you like to do. Um, but be aware that that's an option for you and you may think you want to do one thing, but it may change over time. So be aware of that. All right, so those are your exposure modes. Now, something to know is that when we get into the customizing of the camera, the dial functions, uh, we talked about, you know, one dial does a particular thing. It does exposure compensation. The other one does shutter speeds or apertures. Well, all of that can be adjusted as far as what that dial changes for you. So if you don't like that, you can change it. And I know that I know it sounds kind of particular, but I changed my camera when I was out shooting just because of the way I gripped the camera and what setting I changed most of the time. I felt like, you know what, I'd prefer to have these dials change. I also talked about the dial direction that can also change in there. And so we'll be doing a lot of this customization and I have a lot more examples of that. And we'll be going through it a little bit more closely in that custom menu. So be aware that you're going to have a lot of changes. Keep notes of anything that bothers you because you can probably fix it on this particular camera. All right, there you go. That is the mode dial. Final thing is, is we do have a lock switch on it too. It's a, it's the right type of lock switch. It's very nice. It works like a clicky pen.
Uh, you can press it in and lock it into a particular position. That way, if you're taking it in and out of a camera bag, it doesn't get moved. If you're shooting a sports event and you have it set up in a very particular way and you're kind of rapidly going back and forth, moving around, working with different cameras, you know that it will remain exactly where you want it. So I usually leave it unlocked most of the time because I change from time to time. And it's a pretty nice feel to the dial on there. And so um, it's a pretty secure, solid twist. But if you do want to lock it, just press that little center button in and lock it in. All right, next up, let's talk about ISO. So ISO is the sensitivity of the sensor. And the native sensitivity on this particular sensor is ISO 200. So that is where you want to put the ISO if you want the optimum image quality. If you need a little bit more light gathering ability by the ISO, you can bump it up as necessary from there. We do also have low settings that go down to 80, as well as a full auto mode where the camera will figure it out for you. Let's go ahead and take a look at the quality of these settings on here. And so I always run a camera through an ISO test to see how good it is. Now, the problem with shooting down at ISO 80, and I will shoot at 80 from time to time if I need a lower ISO, compared to ISO 200, is that you're going to lose a little bit of dynamic range. And so you might lose a little bit on your highlights or in your shadows. And so you don't want to shoot at 80 unless you really, really need to do it. Now, generally, the uh, ability of this camera at ISOs up to 1600 are pretty clean. You start noticing a bit more noise at 3200, but I could see how 6400 is still usable. Everything from 12,000 on up is pretty high. Now, from previous generations of this camera, I would say that they've added on a couple of extra stops of ISO here. I'm not sure why. It might be more for technical reasons because sometimes people are using cameras uh, not trying to take beautiful shots, but just trying to capture something under really low light conditions. And the ability to do it is more important than the quality of it. And so these extra two settings at 51,000 and 102,000, no, they're not the type of settings that most people would choose when they're trying to take fine quality photographs. But if you're trying to capture something under extremely low light, it does give you something to work with in there. Now, the ISO settings will actually be available in third stops. I don't have them listed here because they mess up my slides with too many numbers on there. So feel free to set those whenever you want on there. Uh, now, one thing to note on the auto ISO, when the camera is changing ISOs for you, it's just trying to keep an even exposure. And so this is going to work out in some cases where you are shooting subjects that are kind of middle tone gray in their brightness values. They're not overly light or overly dark. That can be helpful, but I often like to set things manually myself so that you know where it's set. You want to keep it set as low as possible for optimum image quality and the least amount of noise. All right, next up is exposure compensation. Now we've already played with this a little bit, but this does have a particular button on there that you can use. And so you can either use the front dial or that button. And so this can be handy when you are in the movie exposure mode and you might have a variety of different programs set. It just gives you another way of setting exposure compensation. So we've already talked about this. If you wanna make your image a little brighter or a little bit darker, we now have a separate dedicated way of doing it rather than one of those dials. Because remember, those dials can be reattributed to doing something else. And so you may have that dial controlling some other aspect of the camera and you still wanna change exposure compensation. And that's why it's there. Next up, very important in exposure is the metering system. So on the top left shoulder of the camera are a couple of buttons. The one towards the back of the camera is one that will control the metering when you turn the front dial. These are kind of dual purpose buttons over there. It depends on which dial you turn. And so by turning the front, you can change it through the different metering systems. Let's take a look at what they are and what they do. First up is digital ESP. That stands for electro selective pattern. It's basically a whole bunch of metering points that measures the light and compares and contrasts the light areas and the dark areas. And it's got a little algorithm that it follows to give you a good exposure. And generally speaking, it does a really good job. And so this is where most people are going to leave this camera most of the time. 
Next up is center weighted metering. This is where the camera will most heavily measure the light in the middle of the frame. And this is a older traditional system. Some people still like it. So it is available on there kind of for legacy reasons. Next is a very, very sharp knife in the toolbox, you might say. It's the spot metering. And this is where it measures the light in a very small area. So if you want to be extremely precise about your light measurement off of a particular subject, you can do it off of just 2% of the frame. This would probably be the place of the biggest mistake that you could make if you accidentally leave it here, not realizing it's here, because uh, it's going to throw off your exposures in many, many cases. It's something you need to be very careful about using. Now this has a highlight metering system, which uses that spot area to look for areas of brightness and base it on the brightness areas. And so it's gonna get you the correct exposure if what is in that spot is about two stops overexposed. And we also have a spot shadow, which is looking for areas of darkness, about two stops dark. So these are very unusual light metering patterns that are things that most people are not gonna use most of the time. It's the digital ESP that most people are going to be fine with, and it's going to be good for a wide variety of photography. Now, you can also find this setting in the menu, and you're going to see this is a fairly common theme. There's going to be a button on the outside of the camera. There might be a way to access it in the super control panel, as well as another separate dedicated menu option that we will talk more about as we get into the menus of this class. Auto exposure lock on the back of the camera is an AEL button, and this is for locking in the exposure. Let's go ahead and take a look at how this works. This is going to work when you are in a semi-automated mode. So if we were to put the camera in, let's say, aperture priority, and we look at the back of the camera, we will see that the camera is currently, let's get the exposure compensation back down here at zero. We are at F4 at 3 20th of a second. If we move the camera off to the side, you'll see that we've dropped down to 200th of a second rather than 320th. If we go farther off, we get to 1 over 160. Well, we can press the auto exposure lock. You can see one press will turn that light on and it will lock in that exposure. And so if we were photographing somebody next to a window, for instance, we could come over here, lock the exposure, and then take the picture here so that things are set for the lighting on the inside rather than the outside. And so anytime you find that you really want to keep a particular exposure, you can just press that in and it locks in until you press that button again. So it's a one press on and one press off. And so it's something that some people use from time to time. And it's another button that some people never use at all. And we're going to be able to reprogram this button if we want to in the custom menu. And so if you don't use auto exposure lock, well, that gives you another very accessible button for doing something else with. All right, the histogram. One of the best ways of judging if you have the correct exposure is with the histogram. And this can be turned on when you are normally shooting by just pressing the info button. You're going to see a small box which is going to show you the histogram. Uh, this is something that you can customize in the custom menu as far as what sort of information you see and when do you see it. And you're going to see this kind of mountain of information, which is going to tell you if you're overexposed or underexposed. Now, this is kind of a dual histogram. It gives you two things. One is the overall area, and then another one, the little green mountain in there, that is showing you what your spot metering is giving you. And so it can tell you how bright or how dark a particular area within the entire screen is. Uh, not to get too much into exposure, but basically an underexposed image is going to be mounted up to the left and an overexposed image is going to be mounted up over to the right. Uh, and so you can take a look at that histogram and you can have a real clear idea, no matter how easily you can see the back of your camera or your viewfinder, whether it's uh, in bright light or dark light, you can see a technical analysis of how good that exposure is. Now, one of the other ways that you can determine if your picture is properly exposed is with the highlight and shadow alert. These are blinking lights that will turn on that will show you pixels that are either overexposed or underexposed. Now, this is something that you can customize in the info settings of your camera. You can turn it on and off. And you can also go in and particularly 
set the exact highlight and shadow range that you want to blanket you. And so this is a convenient way for you to find out if something is overexposed or underexposed. Well, this is something that you can turn on. If you don't like it, well, you can just turn it off by pressing the info button, but this can be customized. And we'll look more at that as we talk about some of the display options in the camera. All right, another exposure related issue is flicker. And this is happening because of the type of light sources that we are photographing in. And this has become more of a common problem because of the changing standards in the way lighting is done and the available lights that we have. Now this camera has three different little flicker things that you're gonna find in the menu. And I thought I'd have one slide that talks about all three of them together. We're gonna to talk about each one of these a little bit more later on. First up in shooting menu number one is flicker scan. And this is gonna fix a problem caused by LED lights. And what this does is it gives you a fractional shutter speed, meaning it could be 124th of a second rather than 125th. It gives you these very fine adjustments in the shutter speeds in order to try to find a place where the flicker is not visible. Uh, and so this is gonna be good under LED type lights. There is another one called anti-flicker shooting, and this is gonna be good under fluorescent lights. Now, fluorescent lights, what they tend to do is they tend to go brighter and then darker and then brighter and darker, whereas LED lights will turn on and off, on and off very quickly, and so it's a different type of problem. The anti-flicker shooting, what it does is it shoots at the peak brightness. It times the lights on its wave as it goes from light to dark, and it times everything so that it, you get the maximum brightness. So there's consistent and the brightest possible light that you can shoot under. And that might result in slower motor drive shots. Let's say if you're at a gymnastics event, which I was at one point when I first re realized this flicker problem, um, and they have certain type of lighting in the gym sometimes that flicker, and it can cause a lot of problems, and this will save you quite a bit from a lot of hassle. And then finally, there is anti-flicker live view. This has nothing to do about the actual photograph that you are shooting. This is just the impact on the screens that you're looking at and makes it a little bit easier to see in the screen because it may cause the screen to flicker itself uh, depending on the light and the screen and the camera. And this helps fix that particular problem. So realize that there are different flicker options and these are all of them in the camera. We'll talk more about each of these as we get to it in the menu system. Exposure bracketing is a great tool if you are not sure about the correct exposure and you just want to shoot it right out in the field and you'll figure it out when you get back home. So in shooting menu two is auto exposure bracketing and there's lots of different options for the number of frames and their exposure apart. And this is very much like exposure compensation only the camera is doing it for you much quicker and automated so you don't have to make these adjustments yourself. Now this is something I prefer to use with aperture priority. Uh, that way you can set up a particular aperture. Uh, you shouldn't be shooting things that move around too much with this because it takes a little time to shoot all three or five frames or seven frames and you don't want anything being in different position here. So let's go ahead and do a quick exposure bracket on this just to show you how it works. Now I've already got my camera in aperture priority, so that's a good place to be for this. So I'm gonna dive into the menu system and I'm going to dive over into the second set of shooting modes. And on the third page in there is bracketing options. And the first one is auto exposure. Auto meaning the camera is automatically going to change the exposure for us. And I wanna select five frames at one stop. We can go down and we can do even further, but I like uh, one full stop changes in aperture. And so I'm gonna go ahead and set that up. So what's gonna happen now is the camera is going to shoot through a number of exposures and it's gonna change the shutter speed, but it's gonna keep the aperture the same. Now I'm gonna just check one other thing that we haven't really gone in and talked a lot about, and that is the drive setting. Drive setting here is on sequential, which is perfect. That's where I like it to be. So what that means is that when I press down on the shutter release and I hold it down, it's gonna shoot through the five shots and then it's gonna stop. It's not gonna to go to six, it's not gonna stop at one, it's gonna do exactly the five shots. So here we go. 
And there is all the shots. And now we're going to do is play back and take a look at what went on. I'm going to hit the info button so that we can see exactly what's happening here. And so on this particular shot, we can see it's in an 80th of a second, F4, and this is the two stop overexposed, one stop overexposed, one under, two under, and our normal one. So the, the sequence is it shoots the normal one first, and then the darkest to the lightest. And you can notice the histogram changes over here as well, so you can see if you're getting the right exposure there. And so that way we have guaranteed ourselves the correct exposure. Now I'm going to dive back into the menu and I'm going to turn this feature off because this would be a dangerous feature to leave turned on when you didn't know about it. And so this is something that uh, can be good for a variety of reasons. Uh, there are people who do HDR photography. We'll talk a little bit about that in a second, uh, where you want a collection of white exposures to combine into one. Or maybe you're not sure just what the single best exposure is. And this is a great way of collecting a few images in order to work later out uh, what one was the best. So exposure bracketing when you're unsure about the correct exposure. All right, live neutral density. Now this is one of my favorite features about this camera. This is not something that I've seen on other brands of cameras. Neutral density is usually a filter that you would put on the front of the lens in order to get even slower shutter speeds. Let's say that you're photographing a waterfall and you want to get a nice long shutter speed, but your camera will only allow you to get down to a half a second. Half a second gives you a little bit of motion, but you want to shoot it like 10 seconds. Well, you need a neutral density filter to do that, or you need this camera. Now, when you dive into the menu, the first option is to turn this on and off, something obviously you're only going to leave turned on in very special situations. Next up is the ND number. How much do you want to slow things down by? And really depends on the type of look that you are trying to get. And so you might want to try a variety of these out depending on your situation to see what works best for what you're doing. And then finally is live view simulation. Now, if your camera is on a tripod, I would leave this turned on. If you are trying to handhold the camera, which is not really the best option, uh, you may want to turn this off because things can get very blurry and hard to see in the viewfinder, as I will show you here in just a moment. And so the idea on this one, I was shooting some water that was moving. All right. Now, at a normal ISO of 200 and a small aperture of f22, I could get down to 1 20th of a second. Not exactly a really long shutter speed. Now I went down to the low setting of 80, so I could get to an even longer shutter speed of an eighth of a second, and we're really not seeing much movement in the water right here. So now I'm going to turn on the live neutral density just at the ND2, which is giving us a one stop slower shutter speed, and we have a quarter of a second. Eh, still not that good here. And so as you can see, we can go further and further with this. And now that we've gotten up to a full second, we're starting to see some motion of that water that's looking pretty good. And we're going to go up to ND32 and ND64, which takes us all the way up to eight seconds. And now we're getting the look that I was kind of hoping for with a long shutter speed here. And so you can set this according to your needs. You're probably going to need to do a little bit of experimentation with it. And it's a lot of fun, and it's a great way of not having to bring the neutral density filter out. Now, if you still have a neutral density filter, well, you can combine that onto this, and you can go even longer. So if you do like this type of photography, this is a fantastic camera for that. Now, one of the things I did want to show you in here is that live ND. Now, we don't have a lot of moving stuff here in front of us, so it's going to be a little hard to show you here. And so in this, we're going to go to page one of this shooting two menu. And this is uh, not available right now because we're not in the correct shooting mode. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up here to the full manual mode and we're going to see if we can get down to this now. Now we can turn this on. All right, so let's uh, slow this down quite a bit. We'll go down to 64 and we want to have our live view simulation on and we want to go up here and make sure that live neutral density shooting is on. Now. One of the things that this does by turning this on is it automatically slows down the shutter speeds appropriately for the situation. Now, if I was to put my hand here, let's make sure I've got this. I did not get this set on, so we're going to set this on here. 
So now it is on, and you can see that my hand does weird things. And if I hold it here, it slowly becomes more steady. And so it's combining different images. If I zoom back and forth, you'll see that it looks very weird. And this will look more natural when you have subjects that are moving like a waterfall in front of it. And so it's something that uh, you got to see to believe in some cases. This is a great little feature to play with, especially when you are wanting longer shutter speeds for rivers, waterfalls, things like that. I encourage you to get out there and give this a try because this is doing something that you just can't do with, well, most other cameras. All right, high dynamic range. And so every scene has a range of tones from dark to light. And sometimes it's beyond what our cameras can handle. And when that's the case, that's when HDR comes in. What it does is it's shooting multiple exposures at different brightness levels and then combining all of that into a final image, at least in the HDR1 and HDR2 modes. Now, some people prefer to take their HDR images as individual shots in the camera and use a separate software program on their computer to combine those images. And so there are two different ways. There's the built-in computer in the camera to do it, or you can have some external one. And this allows you to shoot HDR images for both. Now, when you don't do it in camera, it's just a bracket series that we just talked about a, a couple of minutes ago. And so do you want a finished HDR image in camera, or do you just want a bracket series? And here's another place to get a set of bracketed images. And so this can be common in situations where you have sky as well as some shadow areas in an image. And so our standard JPEG image is gonna have some shadows that are kind of blocked up and some highlight areas which are blown out. We don't see any detail in there. And so with this HDR1 and HDR2 image, we're gonna get a little bit more information in those highlights or in those shadow areas. And you'll notice the resulting histogram is gonna look a little different from one to the other. Now, this is gonna be a JPEG composite final image, and it's gonna be limited in what it can do. The camera is a very good camera, but there are limitations as to how much it can do in here. And so if you are really into HDR, you may wanna take that bracketed series of images and work with some external software programs. Now, if you wanna do that with those external programs, there are a lot of different bracket options. And once again, this is just exposure bracketing as we talked about before, but it's in a different area with a lot of very similar settings as far as how many stops and how much exposure difference. In this case, you do have a little bit greater exposure difference because you can do uh, three stop exposure changes. And so if you wanna grab a wider range of tones, you'll be able to do a little bit more of that here than in the standard auto exposure bracketing. All right. A lot of things to talk about on exposure, and we're not really done, although we are done with the section. Uh, there will be many more items that we talk about when we get to the shooting menu number one, uh, because there's a lot more fine tuning controls and some other things that you want to know about in your exposure when we get into that menu shooting later on in the class. All right, so there you go, folks. That is your main exposure controls. I hopefully see that you have uh, some little areas to play with and experiment to really get to know this camera and the full capabilities of it. Great system, enjoy it, and get out there and really experiment with everything that you can.